right, ladies and gentlemen, this is not hyperbole. One of the greatest comedians in the history of stand-up comedy, our guest for tonight, David Brenner. That was well here done. We go. <laughs> We're gonna have some fun. Pull me over here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh boy, here's just a couple of kids from Philadelphia at the Y. Here we are. Um, let's talk about audiences. I mean, you face giant audiences. This is one of the best ones I've ever had. I was going to ask, actually. <laughs> what do you sense from these characters? I mean, you know, when a comedian comes out on stage, big yeah. house, little house, television show, how long does it take for you to realize what you're going to get and what you're not going to get from the audience? That's a great question. I can tell. Within 30 seconds, I could tell you, I could rate my show from a zero to 100. In 30, In 30 seconds. seconds, I can tell you. And I put up little test balloons to see what they're into, what they're not into, real fast. You can tell very, like, I know you're in trouble with this audience. <laughs> I'm in trouble? I'm going to be great with them. But me. You have a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, you have trouble. All right, here's what I thought we, I, I have a, as an interviewer, particularly for a program like this, I'd like to be, we did this with Tony Roberts, linear, just in the very beginning. Okay. So I'm going to mention a couple early things about your life, then I'm going to ask you to pick up. So South Philadelphia, most used his humor to become the president of a class, everything from 4B all the way up to senior high school, never lost an election after that. After high school, hung out in the corner for a while, went into the army, became a cryptologist in for the, uh, the Air Force, uh, no, excuse me, Air, Airborne Unit, 101 Airborne, right? I was, I was in 101st Airborne first, then I was right. in the cryptography. Then you come back, go to Temple, mm -hmm. communications major, graduate with honors. So we know you're funny, and we know you're smart. Take it, give us an elevator speech about from getting out of Temple to your first appearance on The Tonight Show in 1971, <laughs> which skyrocketed you. Well, when I got out of Temple University, I uh, was living at 6149 Market Street above a laundromat. And the heat, when, when it was like 85 degrees in Philadelphia, the heat in my apartment was about 130. <laughs> and there were silverfish bugs all over the place. Very pleasant. Yeah, and the elevated line, the train, was about 20 feet from my bedroom window. So you couldn't sit, like if we were sitting there now talking, this would have already walked off the table. <laughs> so, and I, I had a, here I had a degree. I've been working since I'm eight and a half years old. I never didn't have a job, I, and I can't get a job. With the degree or anything, I can't get a job. I tried to go down to the docks. They were unloading a ship of sugar. I read about it, I heard about it. I went down there. I didn't even get the job to carry sugar bags. I was totally dejected, and I got a call from uh, my professor, Bill Seibel, who was a, I was a major in journalism and mass communication. And he said, they're looking for a writer of documentaries at NBC. I said, that's great because- NBC in Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Right. And I said, that's great, but what's, what's, I don't do documentaries. I don't know anything about them. I like them, but I don't know anything. He said, I got you an interview. You go in. I went in for the interview. The first question was, uh, what do you know about uh, uh, writing for documentaries for you know, television? I said, nothing. <laughs> Second question was, what do you know about filming documentaries? I said, nothing. <laughs> he said, what do you know about editing? I said, look, you can stop there. <laughs> because the answer to everything I can tell is going to be nothing. I said, if you want someone with experience, pull a guy out of New York City. I said, but if you want someone who's going to work harder and learn faster than anyone who walks into this building, I'm your man. Here, I wrote this documentary over the weekend. Read it. And I walked out, done. And I called, uh, I saw my professor, how'd it go? I said, bombed. I said, I, 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 don't, have, you know, I don't have a chance. And I got home and I was with a woman at that time living in that horrible place. Imagine how much she was in love. Cool. And, <laughs> and, and uh, she came home and said, she was a med tech, and she said, uh, let's have, a, let's have a, uh, a, a summary of our, our wealth. I said, what are you kidding? And, she said, no, let's, I said, don't, don't let's start with the money. I had a bad day. She said, uh, uh, she said I, well, how much do you have? 
I said, how much do I have? I, I bought a couple paperbacks. I was at the university. And this was a couple days later at the university. I said, whatever I have, I put on the dresser. So she went over and over three quarters and a nickel. And she said, well, she said, counting what I have in my purse, what's hidden in the kitchen, you know, the high things in the kitchen, and whatever we have in the, in the bank. I said, we don't have a bank account. <laughs> she said, right, including the bank. We are worth a total of 80 cents. <laughs> she said, well, what, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know about you. It's like 180 in here. I said, let me sleep on it. So I just, I was just in the jeans and no shirt, and I flopped down in bed, and she got over, got undressed, she got in bed, and the phone rang, and it was this guy, Jack, uh, Jack Riley from NBC. He said, it's Jack Riley. And I said, oh, how you doing, Jack? He says, good. He said, uh, well, I'll see, you, uh, I'll see you tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock. I said, I thought, this is great. I got a chance at another interview. You know, I won't mess it up. And I said, but, you know, and I never like getting up early in the morning. So I said, do I have to come in at 9? Can I, you know, I said, I have a, I have a lot of things to do. And, and, you know, and like try to save my life here in this apartment. I have a lot of things to do. I said, he said, well, you know, we, we open the doors. We start at 9 o'clock at the studio. I said, yeah, I know that. Well, how about 1, 1, 2.30? <laughs> and he said, I don't think you understand, David. Uh, you got the job. Oh, great. And it was at the top price I asked for. I had the guts to ask for the top price. He said, you got the job. And I went there, and I ended up getting my own television series, and I did you know, all those documentaries. And everything. 115 documentaries. Yeah. So, so the, but there has, there's a, a transition to comedian. There's a transition to, oh. from the funny guy who was entertaining his yeah. classmates to probably putting humor in some documentaries. Somebody's got to get up on stage with material. How did that happen? Yeah, well, that's, it wasn't a transition. It was an explosion. I exploded my career. I realized after doing 115 documentaries on all the subjects that we see today, you know, overspending by the federal government, misunderstanding of the welfare system, overcrowded prisons, the death penalty, capital punishment, you name it, if you got my old documentaries, dusted them off, forgot the hairstyle and the clothing <laughs> style, you would think they're just ready to go on the air now. Right. And nothing changed. In my youthful naivete, I thought I'm going to present the problem, I'm going to present possible solutions on both sides, and the public will rise up, and they'll go to the government, <laughs> and we're going to change it. And everyone, including the Mexicans and Indians, are going to be happy in America. <laughs> And nothing was happening, and I decided I'm not going to do this. Besides, I always wanted to be rich to help the family and my friends. I'm not getting rich. And I just, I quit. And I went to an island of Nevis. No one was there. It was the only white guy in the whole island, which I was used to. I was the only white guy in West Philly. Yeah, right. You know, I was used to that. And, um, and it rained three days, and I was listening to the transoceanic radio, sitting in there with the rain pouring down, and I was listening to the news, and I said, man, it's so depressing. People got to laugh at this stuff. I thought, you know what, I've been funny since I'm four. I'm going to take the pressure off. I'm not going to look for a career. I'm just going to get up and do comedy for a year and then quit. Hmm. And, and that's how I made the decision. Yeah, with no major ambition, just going, mm. that's, that's how you're going to spend your time. No, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a comedian. I didn't have any desire whatsoever. When I did the, uh, the only reason I did the first Tonight Show is, well, I chose it because they didn't want me. They had seen me and they didn't want me. So that got, my, that got me angry. So I said, I'm, I, I told my young agent, David Yeager, I said, don't go for any TV show, only The Tonight Show. And I went there on Wednesday nights, they had auditions. Yeah. And I made believe I was a manager. I had one suit, I put it on. And I would go there and they had finger sandwiches. And so I ate there, every Wednesday night I ate there. <laughs> and and I, uh, w I watched the comedians, what they laughed at, the people, you know, Fred D. Cordova, the producer and all the others. Yeah. I watched what made them laugh. And then I went and I wrote, I write on stage anyway, I, I wrote monologues that would fit their sense of humor. So when I got the call to do it, and I said, uh, and there was an agent that called me up, and I didn't know him, and he said, uh, uh, the Tonight Show audition, uh, tomorrow night, you, you want to? You wanna? I said, yeah. He said, uh, they want you for tomorrow night. I said, okay. He said, are you ready? And I had seen, you know, I love cowboy movies, and in one cowboy movie, John, John Wayne, is uh, with uh, Ward Bond was heading up the, the wagons, and the Indians were coming, and they had to form a circle, 
And John Wayne said the word Bond, as he took the reins and he took it, he said the word Bond, are you ready? And Ward Bond said, I was born ready. <laughs> so when he said to me on the phone, are you ready? I said, I was born ready. <laughs> and he said, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> and I said, nothing, I'll be there, I'll, go, I'll be there. And I went there and bam, I got, you know, I blew the roof off the place and, and just uh, a few days later, I was, I was on tonight's show, and you saw some of the clips, the black and white yeah. ones that first time, and my whole life changed. Yeah, let's, let me fill you in a little bit there. David did uh, more appearances on The Tonight Show, including hosting The Tonight Show, than any other performer in the Johnny Carson era, 158 appearances. So right. I'm gonna, what do you think Carson saw in David Brenner that he liked so much? Well, I once asked him, he, I, I did about my 40th shot or something, and we took a commercial break, and Johnny said, uh, David, you know, did you ever wonder why I never let you do just the panel, just sit and talk? Because that was prestigious. You know, Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin, after you scored heavily, they just, you just came and sat down. Yeah. And here I am, 40-some times, and I'm still doing monologues, you know. But never, time. you never invited the couch. No. Ne never, yeah, right, never come and sit down. So, of course, I was curious. I'm not going to lie to him. I said, of course, I want to, you know, yeah, I'm curious. He said, I, I do this because I like to smoke a cigarette and laugh for six and a half minutes. And I know you'll do that. And I ended up doing 157 monologues. One time they were running out of time and I chose to sit on the panel only. But I did a hundred, that's the thing I'm proudest of, I did 157 monologues. That's amazing. Yeah, that, that's amazing. amazing. I, um, I was thinking about, the last time I saw you was down at the Metropolitan, right. Right, which was a good renewal. I hadn't seen you perform for a couple of years and you've been working in Vegas and everything. And it refocused me on the, approach to humor of David Brenner, which is essentially, David Brenner is the father of what we call observational humor. Now, there's all different kinds of comedians doing, doing humor. You could be a Rodney Dangerfield telling right. jokes. Right. You could be a clown, like Jerry Lewis. You could right. be doing stick, like, uh, like Steve Martin. Uh, you could be, I wrote one other one, a storyteller, like yep. Danny Thomas or mm -hmm. Alan King. Why did observational humor become your style? That's another good question. You're on a roll. You, got, you have great, great questions. Um, I had to think even with your questions. Um, <laughs> that gives me time to have a cigarette over yeah. here. <laughs> Usually I just put myself automatic pilot. Oh, well, so, we spent about wait. 10 minutes on this this afternoon. <laughs> Go, yeah, right. Go ahead. So, um, I didn't, I didn't uh, make a choice. Uh, my father was the funniest man I ever met uh, to this day, and I met all the greats, the Burns and Bob Hope and Jack Benny, and no one was as funny as my father. And, and I picked up that genetic from my father. And I did, I did observational comedy as a little boy. I saw things in, in, in society, simple things that were like stupid and dumb. And, and I remember once walking out of a movie, and when I was in South Philadelphia, I walked out of a movie with my mother. She took me to a cowboy movie. She hated cowboy movies. I guess, my father was probably in jail, and, and she took me. And so I, I watched, and I came out, and I said, Mom, that's the last cowboy movie. They're so dumb. She said, David, you love cowboy movies. How can you say? I said, well, the endings, they, you know, they all end the same way with the shootout scene, with good guys coming down the street towards the bad guys. And one good guy always says to the other good guy, you take the one on the left. <laughs> and he never, he never asked the question I would ask. Is that our left or their left? I said, you know? And I, 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 was, I was about four and a half, five years old when I, that was my sense of humor. So I did that on television. I mean, what am I going to do? It's my natural bent. But you're not, you only tell one joke, your father's, the, your father's joke. But so I thought, you know, I'll, I'll be on the pitcher's mound here, and I'm going to throw you three, I think, pretty much softball okay. observational humor subjects. All right? And then maybe we'll get somebody from the audience to yell out one. So, Facebook. I signed on to Facebook. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't understand, but I signed on, they said it's good for your career. <laughs> and in about three weeks, I, I had 5,000 friends. I know three of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I go on once in a while, and, but the worst thing was, at one time I came up with an idea. 
I said, you know, I have an idea. I'll put it on Facebook. And I wrote, how about this for an What do you think of this? For? Here's an idea. Suppose, you know how race car drivers have the patches of all the companies that own them, you know, the tire company, the, the oil company. I said, suppose we made congressmen wear the patches of the lobbyists who own them. <laughs> all right, now, okay. But here's the problem. So the first person wrote, David, that's brilliant. You should be in, in Congress. I said, oh, yeah, and I open the next one. That's a great idea. Something has to be done about it. Second one. The third one says, maybe we can all get together at something and form something and get something done with Congress. I said, oh, that's great. Now the fourth one was, why are you getting so upset about Congress? I burnt my grilled cheese sandwich this morning. <laughs> the fifth person wrote, did you put the butter on before or after? <laughs> The, the next 15 or 20 were about butter and bread. And I said, what happened to the lobbyist idea? All right. Ready? Getting older. I don't know much about it. Yeah, that's a, you know, that's a real, that's a real problem, man. You don't realize it. You, you know, you say, you ever notice you say to a, an older person, you know, really an older person, much older than we are, and you say to them, what, what was the best time in life? And they always say the same thing. Oh, the best time in life is right now. And you look at them and say, are you, <laughs> are you serious? You, you don't have mirrors in your house? Are you, you know. <laughs> right? They always do that. <laughs> all right, one more, one more. Um, we've all seen this. I know you. Next up, I want to talk about your preparation, the, the reading and television, how you absorb material. But we all watch the nightly news. On the nightly news, there's all manner of commercials for, you know, medical project, medicines, antidepressants, and things like that. What do you think of disclaimers at the end of those? I will vote for president, elect the man king or woman a queen who can read those before they end the commercial. <laughs> you ever try it? Here's a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am not, and I'm not, I'm not a fan. And, and, then, and then there's always the, you know, the, the brags of what things get done. What scares me is, they, you know, they say, this is very good. If you're, you know, there was a thing called, uh, wait a minute, I can't think of, the, of, of what it was. But it was a pill, and they and and it was supposed to you know that this pill was a wonderful pill, and they gave the side effects and the side effects, the side effects of the pill were um, that you, uh, you you couldn't have sex you have sex problems, you know you would have sex problems, you would have diarrhea, <laughs> and you you would have a constant vomiting it could be a side effect. <laughs> And you know what the pill was for? Depression. <laughs> now, what's more depressing, you get in bed, you soil your pajamas, you throw up, and you can't do it. What's more depressing? Well done. All right. It, it, in my career, you know, I started managing a comedy team, Patchen and Tarsus. In my career, I've known, as you have, a lot of comedians and some of the greats. I've always, seriously, considered comedians among the most intelligent people I know. Like male actors here, comedians here. Um, and singers. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about the, the intellect that goes into humor. I mean, tell us a little bit about your daily, weekly routine, what you read, what you watch, and how the process goes because you continue to evolve fresh material all the time. It's not right. like some people like, God bless him, Pat Henry had an act, and the act stayed the yeah, act right. year after year. Yeah, right. Your act continues to evolve yeah. based on what's going on. Well, what I do is I, I uh, read about six different newspapers every day. I uh, glean information from in a month from about oh, 50, 75 magazines that I, I, I read. Uh, I uh, listen to radio. I uh, surf on the internet in the daytime, in the evening, and I, um, and I, I do all this research. And I think one thing I'm doing that's really stupid is newspapers to me are the best source of information. 
And I read that 42% of the American people do not believe anything they read in the paper. And that's what I'm reading. <laughs> and, the, and the worst part is I read that statement in a paper. <laughs> so I take all this and then I just get premises. I don't, I don't get jokes. I get a premise. There's something funny in it. I put it all on, on cards and I get up on the stage and then if you see me working, you saw me work, I'm flipping cards. And I'll flip a card and I hope I think it's something funny, of course. And sometimes I don't. So you see me do a lot of flipping. I do a lot of flipping, but I count on this little person that my father gave me, they put in my head, that says things. You'll see me sometimes laugh on television. I'm laughing because I'm hearing that joke for the first time too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's true. And it's, it's all, it's just, I, I can't believe, I couldn't believe when the first time I got paid in Sheepshead Bay, Bro Pips in Brooklyn, the first comedy club. Oh yeah, whoa, a lot of people from Brooklyn. I love Sheepshead Bay. I used to go there, you know, watch my friend float up. It was really nice. <laughs> and, and, and I got $35 for the weekend. And I thought, man, I'm getting paid for being funny. I was always thrown out of school for being funny, got in trouble in jobs for being funny, even in the army I got in trouble for being funny, and now I'm getting paid for being funny, which made no sense to me because it's just genetic. It would be like someone comes up to me, you're what, about what, 6'2"? Six, six six, yeah, 6'2". Six and uh, you have uh, you know, salt and pepper hair now, and I say, yeah, and, and dark brown eyes, that's right. Uh-huh, here's $100. <laughs> I had nothing to do with it. So it's amazing that, you know, that it's just a natural form for me. Tell me about the voice. Tell, tell us all a little bit more about the voice. Is that your father's voice? Yeah, and well, my father. My father, I'll, I'll give you an example. My, yeah. my father, how, how funny my father was. Um, he, he was a tough looking guy, you know. And, and, uh, he was a bookie, right? Yeah, he was a bookie, a numbers writer. Yeah, he was a numbers writer. And, and he had a photographic memory for numbers, so he never could get arrested. He had all the bets in his head. What, are you going to take his head? Your Honor, here's the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, I was out with him one day. We were walking. He was collecting the bets, and, I was, and we ran into his best friend, Lou DeLuca. And DeLuca was the best-looking man I ever saw in my life, you know, like Italians can be. That's so handsome. And he was sharp, and he could sing, and he had perfect white teeth, and he had the cool hair, and he dressed. He was immaculate. And, and we ran into him now. And... Uh, as they're talking, uh, a couple of women from the neighborhood, all dressed up, walk by, and they flirted with my father, which I saw a lot all the time. They flirted with my father. And they walk by, and, 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 and Lou DeLuca says, and my father's name was Lou, too. He said, Lou, let me ask you a question. He said, look, you're, you're like a, you have an interesting face, you know? You like an interesting looking, tough guy. You got like a tough guy look and everything. He says, look at me, I'm beautiful. <laughs> and my father says, Lou, you are the most beautiful man in Philadelphia. He says, then here's my question. How come when I'm with you, and women walk by, like those two who just went by, they always flirt with you. They don't flirt with me. And my father said, DeLuca, let me ask you a question. When you finish going to the bathroom, do you shake it? He said, of course I shake it. My father says, I step on it. I'll see you later, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? <laughs> so that's when the voice was born? Yeah, that, and he put that in my head. I'm always thinking funny, no matter what. I mean, I remember one time there was a, a, someone in the family that passed away. It was a, one of the brothers of my father. And we were at the funeral, and my father was very stoic. He had the dark glasses on, and he just stood erect. He just never showed any emotion. And uh, people were coming by, and I don't know why, because in Jewish, usually, they, the coffin's closed, but it was open. And I noticed, I was a little boy, I was maybe nine or ten years old, and I, I, and I noticed so they had a similarity. And I stood up. Now, my family was made out of Orthodox Jews, you know, and conservative and reformed. And um, I stood up, and I turned around to everyone. I said, I don't understand something. Few people walking by, they look in, they say, Uncle Joe, he looks like himself. Who's he gonna look like? He dies, he's gonna look like Aunt Sarah? I mean, I don't understand. <laughs> so the conservatives, the conservatives grimaced, 
the, you, know, the, you know, and the, the Orthodox had fits, and the liberals laughed, and that was it. Now we're outside, and everyone's coming by, you know, oh, you know, with the, you know sorry, what happened? And, and then, and then that's, we should get together in a happier time. And my father loved to punch holes in hypocrisy. And he'd say, how about if we come over for dinner Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> and they'd look, you know, like, he'd say, all right, wait, Friday, are you free, available Friday? I'll bring the kids, we'll come over Friday. <laughs> so anyway, it thinned out, and then there was no one there, and he said, you know, he called me Kingy. He said, you know, Kingy, I, I forgot to tell you something about humor. There's a time and a place for it. I said, oh, and that wasn't the right time or place, huh? And he said, no, it wasn't. I never heard him use a gruff voice huh. to me in my whole life at that hmm. time. And I really, oh, geez, really upset me. And he just stood there, and then he, five seconds later, he turned and he said, but it was so damn funny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as long as we're talking about your father, we should quickly mention, well, it's no real rush. Uh, the, 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 um, back in the day, on one of my TV shows. Oh, the, I know the, where you're going you, to go. You, you can see this if you go to Bill Boggs TV on YouTube. But I'm not plugging that, but it's, it's worth it. Yes. Tell, tell the story of what well, happened. Well, I'm not going to tell him the ending because it ruins it. It's a, the greatest practical joke ever played on me. And I'm real good because I don't trust anyone. I don't even trust myself. <laughs> and, and Yeah, you don't and, have to give it away. That's well, right. Yeah, I shouldn't give it away. Yeah. And Bill Boggs' dad was there. And the Father's we, Day special. Yeah, it was Father's Day special, uh, turkey, and we had turkey dinners being served on the air. It was a great idea. And he invited me, and, and, said, and, I, and I forget who else was on the show, and there were a few st stars on the show. And there was this annoying waiter, this old guy. He'd he, 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 he come over and he, he slammed the food down in front of me. Another time he had his thumb in my, in my potatoes. <laughs> he was totally annoying. And I'm not going to tell you, you've got to see this because it is brilliant. It's brilliant. Go to, don't go to his uh, YouTube, yeah, anyway, okay, and see it. Anyway, yeah, but yeah, I think of that fondly. Let's talk a little bit about our hometown, Philadelphia. You know, I just drove, I live in New York, but I still go back to Philadelphia regularly. Mm -hmm. um, on Friday, my girlfriend Jane, who's on the front row, told me that uh, Chris Matthews, who's from Philadelphia. Yeah, he's yeah, a Philly guy. He was decrying the fact that the, the Philadelphia accent, of which you are a perfect huh. example, huh. Um, is, is, is disappearing. Yeah. Is it, you know, in Philadelphia, the words mad and sad are not pronounced the same. You're mad. It's mad and sad. Mad and sad. Mad and sad, and, yeah. And, and why, do dogs and cats. Why, you know, the kook and the eagles and the library. Why do you think the Philadelphia accent is changing, and how do you feel about that? Well, I'm upset, of course. I mean, I, I like to say, where is where is going? Yes, <laughs> where is going? And, and we say, uh, uh, well, all the, there are so many that, you know, people can pick us out. The Eagles. Yeah, the Eagles. Library. Yeah. yeah. Attitude. Yeah. yeah. It's all, all the Philadelphia. I've worked hard to try to and reduce you, mine. What is it? Beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> and then my brother, who had several doctorate degrees, would always say, it's not yours, it's Mayan. <laughs> Mayan. Now, I got, I got rid of Mayan. Yeah. But I didn't get rid of, and I really tried. You know, I tried my best to get rid of. I, I had a speech class, and the professor actually said, there were about 80 students in the Temple University. He said, if you want to hear the worst Philadelphia accent you'll ever hear, hang around with David Brenner. <laughs> <laughs> so this, it's disappearing, I think. And, and I was reading an article about it. They think uh, the um, educational level is going up in Philly. Philly. Yeah. <laughs> it's going up in Philly. And, and it's just like, it's not, and what's amazing then, it's happening all over the city. It's not just happening in like South Philly that's changed, or yeah. West Philly where, you know, I'm from those two neighborhoods. I think it's a great accent. You know, why, why can't, you know, people always, my kids, my, I have three sons, and they'll come home from school one day with a little guy, Wyatt, comes home from school. And I said, uh, hey, yo, Wyatt, how you doing? He says, good, Dad, how you doing? I said, good, good. How you doing, Dad? I said, I just told you, I'm doing good. He said, oh, how you doing, Dad? I said, why do you keep saying, how you doing, Dad? He says, well, how you doing? Because we're the only ones who say, how you doing? Who says that? <laughs> who comes, how you doing? How are you doing? Right? right? So they, they mock me. They mock me. Your own have children. Enough. Yeah, well, they're adults now. They're still mocking me. I think there's a time for mocking. It, it expires. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about some of your books. Um, you've written five books. The first book, I remember I interviewed you about it, and I have an autographed copy of this, 
soft pretzels and mustard. Um, there's something in that book that, as always, I've told you this several times, but it had a big, big effect on me. A series of essays about the city, a lot of Philadelphia in it. But there's a little chapter in that book called The Last Time. Oh, yeah. And your premise is beautiful. It says, how would you feel if you knew you were doing something for the last time? Right. It's a, yeah. How many times in our life do we say goodbye to somebody, do something, play volleyball in the backyard, and that we never know that we're never going to do that again? I found that very poignant. Well, I've thought of it hundreds you. of times. Well, what happened? I was, walking, I was walking, and I was thinking one day about, geez, you know, I, I wish I could still get out there and skate. I had a good game of half ball, man, you know? And, and if you knew when you were a kid, if you knew when you were playing football as a kid that this is the last football game you'd yeah. ever play, you'd play your heart out. Yeah. You would give whatever it was the best, the most, and everything. Then I started to think about if you, if, there, if, you, if it's the last time you're going to see someone, and you knew it. You know, I knew an uncle was dying, and I flew in from, I was living in Chicago, I flew in to say goodbye to him, and we talked for a while. And I knew it's the last time I was going to see him, and he knew it was the last time he was going to see me. So it ended right. As I went to the door, and after we said goodbye, and I mean, he said, uh, David, you were a great nephew. Oh. And I said, Telly, you were a great uncle. They were our last words. Mm. That's perfect. So I'm walking down the street, and I, I look, and there's a woman I, I had dated for about a year or so. And she was with two two uh, models. Uh, she was a model and a flight attendant model. And these were two models. And a gorgeous black woman and this gorgeous redhead and, and she was beautiful. And they're sitting there in this outdoor cafe. It was a beautiful sunny day like it was today, you know. And I never really, she was very involved with me and I wasn't that involved with her emotionally, but she was wonderful. And I never really said what I really thought of her. Mm. And here I'm going through this thing about the last time and, and all. And you never know. And so I, I went on, and we started talking. I said, I want to tell you, you are grand. You, and you were so great to me. And you were so special. And, and I go through all the compliments. Where, and then she starts, our tears are coming. I think I'm doing it too much, you know. I, I'm going over, overboard. With, and I said, I just wanted to tell you how much I cared about you in that way. And, and so she stood up in a big kiss. And the other two miles, boom, go. And that night, that young lady went down to a club downtown, and someone spiked a drink, mm -hmm. took her in a car, drove over to 10th Avenue to a motel, raped her, and murdered her. And the next day, on the front page of the Post, and that was her picture, you know, model murdered and all. And that was the last time. And that had such a chilling effect on me, yeah. because it was an affirmation, terrible affirmation, of something I was thinking about. Mm. That's why I'm trying to make this show the best I've ever done, Bill. Good. <laughs> I hope I make it home safely. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> um, the second book, I. Uh, oh yes, I think no, there's a terrorist it, in my soup. No, the second one was. The second one was um, nobody. Uh, nobody sees you, ever sees you eat tuna fish. No one ever sees you eat tuna, tuna fish. fish. Now that, let me just quickly say, my again mention my girlfriend Jane lived in Santa Fe for a long time, seven, twelve years. How many years, Jane? Twelve years. Twelve years. Really returned to New York because she could not get tuna fish. <laughs> I, the only place that had it was a subway that was any good. I will frequently we're on the phone. Would you have to eat today? I had tuna fish today. I, and I realized when I read this title of your book, I have never seen her actually eat, eat tuna, tuna fish. fish. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a truism here. No right, one right. ever sees you eat, eat tuna, tuna fish. Well, it, the, the, I got the title from this. You know, in neighborhood, we didn't have any money. So I would go out, and when I did, when I was a teenager, and we got in clubs at 16, 15 to drink, and we're smoking and all that. And you go in a club, and I, you know, I'd, I'd buy some, hey, this is on me, you know. You know how guys do it. Hey, it's, I got it, I got it. Men do it in bars and restaurants. They don't do it in other places, like a shoe store. Hey, the loafers are on me. I got it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, 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 and then. Was, by the way, was that the voice just then, the loafer line? I don't know. I don't know what I did. Oh, OK, okay. fine. So uh, yeah, no, I don't know. So uh, the uh, uh, guy would come, come over. He'd say, yeah, yo, Brenner. He'd say, you know, I don't understand something. You know, we have the same kind of job. Same lousy job, making the same lousy money. Now, what are you into? Because every time I see you, 
you're like eating steak, you're out with these women, you're buying drinks for everybody. I don't get it. What are you, what are you doing? What are you into? I'd say, when's the, well, when's the last time you, uh, you saw me? He said, I remember exactly what it was. It was on, uh, it was on St. Patrick's Day or some Monday's holidays. He said, I saw you and you were at the you know, Lillian Reese Club and you were doing the same thing there. I said, so that's what? That's uh, um, over two weeks ago. He said, yeah about, yeah, about that. I said, since I saw you there, I've been home every night eating tuna fish, <laughs> saving my money for tonight because nobody ever sees you eat tuna, tuna fish. <laughs> And then I decided to name my book after it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about one I started uh, stumbling through before. I think there's a terrorist in my soup. Uh, how to... Uh, you, find humor. Yeah, how to find humor and solve world problems with laughter. And your personal problems, and I think that's very true. It, 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 the book was based on that, you know, we're so frightened, and it was, it was um, at a time when we're all nervous, and, and the terrorism, we're all nervous about it, and everybody was frightened. And in everything there's humor. In everything there's humor. Go to the airport and instead of being angry, look at these idiots and what they're doing to catch bad guys. 80-year-old <laughs> people with bags, not carrying bags, bags attached to them, <laughs> which is the best day in their life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and taking off shoes, and you've got to take off your shoes because there's one idiot, one idiot puts a bomb in his own shoes. Now, you know, what's, you know what's amazing about that? I don't know if you know that. The plane was up for an hour. The shoe bomber, right? Yeah, sure. And he's trying to light the fuse. He used three matches to light a fuse. You can't bend over and coach like that. <laughs> so... If you, if you look at that, or, or like I, I saw one time, I was in line, I was in line, and a man came over and, and bucked the line, and he had an out of shape case with a chain on it. And he had a, a, you know, one of the top officers with him. And they undid the chain, boom, 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 and the officer handed over documents, they opened it up, and in, inside this box he had, and I know guns a little bit, was a 357 Magnum, this way, already unlocked, you know, ready to go, so that if he reached in that, he had, he had it in position to, to pull it out. Hmm. He was a marshal. Yeah. All right? And so they looked and they checked, they checked the gun, the thing, closed it, and they gave the documents back, they put the chain on it, he had a little bag with him. They took it, and they took out his shampoo, and they threw it away. <laughs> now. <laughs> Let, let's, let's, let's analyze this. They're worried that if this man is on the plane with the 357 and he just goes berserk for some reason, he's going to have to make up his mind the 357 or the head and shoulders bottle. See? So if you, if you just see everything, through that third eye that we all have. Yeah. Everybody has a third eye that thinks something's funny. And if you look at every problem you have in life and try to find, I don't think I could have made it. I couldn't have made it in life, the way I grew up in the horrors that I lived as a child, if I didn't have that sense of humor given to me by my father. And in turn, I guess subliminally, I thought, this is a lot of secret, but I ought to talk about it. I ought to make people laugh. I don't know. I don't know why I did this, you know, and I, and I did get rich, and then I lost it all, but that's another story. That's a, we'll come back to the why when I'm really hanging out in the garbage cans. No, not no, you. no, it isn't that bad. But, you know, your career's, your career's dip and everything, and you, and you have to adjust to it. I was talking to a very good friend of mine, and he was, he was uh, he's a big star, and um, he, he had his day, as you know, as you have, and he was saying, he said, geez, I worked this club, and, and Friday night, the second show, he said, I sold out 450 seats the first show. Second show, I had maybe 40, 50 people in it. I said, you know, this happens to all the, everybody. First of all, they asked Steve Martin, why did you stop doing stand-up comedy? And he gave a great answer, Friday night second shows. They're the worst, yeah. everywhere. In Vegas, if you have 1,000 at the first show, I have 600 at the second. People are tired, they got done work, they had a drive-in, they flew, they were, you know, it's a bad time. Okay, 
So here it is. It's a fr Friday, you know, Friday night second show. And I said to him, what you have to do is you have to not listen to when you stood before a thousand people. You know, in my heyday, I worked, I worked crowds of 40, 50,000 people. Wow. You know, when I worked with superstars, I was co-headlining with them. Myself, I was, I ran from 2,500 to 4,500 4, at night, one night after another, wow. all over the country. At that time, comedians, the most they got were 1,000 people. When I hit you know, my big time, I said, you got to get that sound of that laughter out of your ear and out of your mind. And you got to listen if you're making, there are 50 people there and you're making 45 of them really laughing really good and the other five are laughing, you're a success on that stage. You can't live with the past in your head. You know? Well put, uh, well put. Uh, I, we can go two ways now. We'll take some questions in a couple of minutes. It's going to go back or go, let's go forward. Uh, I introduce you by saying one of the greatest stand-ups in history of stand-up comedy, and there's no, no question about that stature. At this stage of your life, what are your objectives? Well, I still do stand-up. I still travel. I still go on the road. <laughs> it's horrible. It was horrible when I first started. You know, you, first of all, you get the worst room in the hotel. I was in one hotel in Cincinnati. I'm, I can't mention the name, they're still around. I was sure that people in Cincinnati who wanted to commit suicide jumped into the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, you're, you know, they always put you by the, the, the canned sodas and the ice machine is right outside next to you. So I had a friend who was, worked in a stationery store and he printed up out of order signs. <laughs> Good. Good. I took him down in the morning. I had to take him back. <clears throat> and, and I'll tell you the, the best thing, all right, I'll tell you, all right, I'll tell you, this is what, show you the madness so on the road, you get the madness. Here's what I used to do. I was so bored, I'd be in a town like 10 days, seven to 10 days, in this terrible town, small club. This is before television, anything, it was, a, it was, it was rough. <clears throat> anyway, and um, what I used to do to amuse myself is every morning I would put the toilet paper into a point, I put a point. <laughs> And then, like on the, like the fourth or fifth day, I get out of my room and start down the hall, and the housekeepers would be there. And as I pass, I hear one go, "That's that man from Seven B. He he don't shit. <laughs> <laughs> he he been here five days. He, he ain't bad. Shit <laughs> Look at the way he's walking. You can tell he don't shit." <laughs> Actually, you, you went back. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You went back. No, no, that's no, no, good. No, 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 I'm going to tell you where I'm There's going. There's so many now. places to go. But but I'll go forward. Right now. I'll go yeah, forward. Okay, I think I'll go forward. I'd like to know. Sorry, I got, I got carried away. Okay. <laughs> I so I work the road, and I do, you know, I'll go on the little political pundit on, on the networks, <clears throat> do that. Excuse me, and but I'm thinking, and I'm working on this project with a very successful uh, writer, Broadway writer. And we've been talking for months, and I'm going to try, and if it doesn't work, hey, I had a, I had a glorious career. I'm going to try to do a one-man show on Broadway, but not, not about, only about the career. I'm going to talk about my real life, which was really dramatic when I was a kid, you know, and things like, you know, being evicted when I was eight and a half years old. And, and, and we had no place to live. My sister was in the back seat with pneumonia, and, and my brother was in one of the wars he was in, and, and, and it was and my mother was freezing cold, and, and I slept in a house without furniture for a year. You know, my father, I'll show you a sense of humor. I remember one night, I didn't want to complain, but it was bitter cold, and my father just poked his head in and he said, yo, Kingy, how you doing? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really cold tonight. And he said, well, do, do what I do. Lay on your stomach and cover yourself with your back. <laughs> and I had, such, I had such a good laugh that I don't remember ever being cold and not sleeping again. So anyway, I'm thinking of doing this show. It'll be funny, but it'll have pathos. And I think it'll be a good exit for me. 
you know, to say, hey, thank you, everyone, for giving me this glorious life, and, and, and really do something that's never been done, that's never been done. We're going to do it the way it's, it's not going to be me coming out and being funny for, you know, 90 minutes, which I could do in my sleep by now, you know? It's going to be a gripping but funny. Like one the, man show, or is yeah, one, other characters? Yeah, one man, but I'm going to have other characters and yeah. playing very important roles in yeah, it. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, it's not going to be all me. Yeah, that'd be good. You know? So, um, I, would, I hope that this happens because uh, I'm also, I, there's a possibility of another book. I don't know why I do that. You know why I do that? Because I get a great idea for a book. And I go and I, I get a meeting with the publisher. And I pitch the idea. And, and they say, this is terrific. Don't go to any other publisher. We're going to do it. And now we leave. And, and, now we leave and, 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 and I realize, oh my god, i got to write it. <laughs> but I'm doing that. But I hope that that's my, my final bow, you know, is that, is that show. OK. I've got some, I uh, feel like, uh, remember Carson? You said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, from the audience, besides, besides your father in your life, who makes you laugh who, or who has made you laugh? Oh, I'm a great, I'm an easy laugher. You know, Cosby, I think Richie Pryor was the best comedian. I think Cos, of course, George Carlin, Shecky Green, and, and, and Dave Chappelle and the new guys and Chris Rock. I mean, there's some brilliant guys out there. The problem is, there are, when I was coming up, there were about a dozen of us. Steve Landsberg, yeah, Richard Lewis, really only about a dozen expanded. of us. Expanded. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and now, and now uh, there are, they say, between 14 and 17,000 comedians. So, true. so, so uh, I'm, in the, I'm a great audience. I mean, Steve Landsberg one time got up at the improv, and then he went back to his apartment, and he listened to the tape of that performance. He thought he did great, and he listened, and the only person laughing was me. <laughs> Um, if I were writing, a, if I were in the audience, this yeah. is a question I think I would have written. Uh, you mentioned the bill about your touring for, for big stars playing large venues. Give us a thumbnail sketch of a couple of the superstars for whom you opened. Uh, Sonny and Cher, Frank Sinatra. Diana Bross. Diana Bross, yeah. Worked with Diana Caesar's Palace. The best fun I ever had. And Sonny and Cher were just great to be with. But the best fun I ever had Three and a half years, I worked with co-headline with Joan Rivers, and that was the best. Uh, yeah. She's got it. She's lunatic. Yeah, she's good. She's, she's wonderful. got it. Yeah, she's, she's got it. You know, my favorite Joan Rivers line is when she says, I wish I had an identical twin sister so I would know what I look like if I hadn't had plastic surgery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, from the audience. This is an excellent question. Because I always like questions about process and successful creative people. How old were you when you knew you had comedy potential? Com I would say, you mean com commercial comedy oh, potential, yeah. Commercial. Well, I, when I was uh, 17, I was uh, uh, up in the mountains, I was going, I was 19, I was going into the army and I went up there to just, you know, have a wild time. And Phil Foster was the comedian, book then, and he was late. And I was sitting there with two tough guys from Brooklyn and a friend of mine, Bob from Philly. And I'm sitting there, and, I, and we're drinking. And I said, hey, come on, man. I said, hey, if I'm not going to see a show, I'm going to do one. And I just went up on a stage, and I just talked about all the things that were going on at the Bel Air. It's called the Bel Air Country Club. And I, went, and I just talked about all the, the food and the thing, and the people were screaming, and they're laughing. And I'd never been on stage before. And then all of a sudden, I heard a tremendous laugh, and I didn't say anything that funny. And Phil Foster slid out in his underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he took the mic out of my hand, and, he said, he's, and, he, and, and the people were going crazy, and he said, it's the only way I could top you, kid. <laughs> and then a man walked over and gave me his card. His last name was Black, and he said, hey, you're, you're a natural. You could be a comedian. And I said, I don't want to be a comedian. And he said, I said, besides that, I'm going in the Army, you know? And he said, well, you know what? You're a natural. When you come out of the Army, you give me a call. I'm wow. a manager, you know? Theatrical manager, he said. And I had no interest in it, but I always knew when I saw comedians, not egotistically, I saw great comedians, even on television, I'd say, well, I could do that. That's good. Yeah, I just knew it, but not, not a brag, I just, I knew it. It's you like, knew you had that within you. Yeah. Um, somebody, uh, Bruce, Bruce, uh, Bruce Friedman, was brave enough to put his name on this question, talk, <laughs> talk uh, be, uh, and the reason I read that is because it's actually incorrect, the question. Uh, this happens frequently with people who work at Channel 5. They mix up Wonderama with 
the midday show. Oh yeah, your show. Yes. Talk about your days producing Wonder Rama on what, Channel Five. What happened is um, I came into New York to do documentaries, and they weren't ready yet, so they gave me the job of producing a, ch a children's show. Oh, called, he, so he's correct. Yeah, that, yeah. Called, yeah, Wonder Rama with Sonny Fox. You know, with, you know, remember the show? They were probably all the kids who were on it. You know. <laughs> And the, I didn't know that. Funny, <laughs> fast, da, 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 right? And here was here was my job. Here was my wonderful job. Um, uh, you, yeah, you, you're a little girl. You had to go to the bathroom. Follow the pink line. Follow the pink line. And boys, follow the blue line. And then one day, I want to just tell you this. One day, on there, it was a little break, and I, a woman says, "David, you know, uh, turn around." Some mother of two kids, and I, and I turn around, and this woman, beautiful woman. Her face just slipped back to childhood, and she was my girlfriend on and on from fifth grade through high school. Mm. And I looked at her, and she had a little nine-year-old boy and a little girl about five, and she's beautiful dressed, and they were dressed like, and I said, you know, I used to fantasize about running into you one day and not being like I was back there in the, in the, you know, in the neighborhood on the street corner, and here I am with you, and I'm having a tuna fish sandwich and a Coke. <laughs> Same as I did back then. Mm. Now, Bruce, and I apologize, Bruce. The reason I made that, thought you made a mistake was, I, my mistake was, I knew you had worked on the show that was midday, that be, evolved into midday. Yeah, right. But, but yeah. I didn't know prior to that you had worked on yeah. Wonderama. And I did, I did so, so they tried documentaries. I did a couple documentaries, and then they gave me that show three hours live every day, five days a week. Yeah. And it was madness, and, but we, we got through it. You know, I would post a, a camera on the bank across the street, a catty corner across the street. I would post it and just play music like, money burns a hole in my pocket. And that's how I do for 20 minutes. More music, you know, put it on, more music. But, and then I, I said, this is insane, and I left. But I did, I did the kids show. With, oh, best one, I'll tell you best one. Sonny Fox, bless him, he was a genius at what he did. A great and a very handsome man, articulate, he had it all and a great ego. And I told him one day, you know, your ego's so big, when I look in the mirror, I see you. <laughs> and, and, and one day, he's there, and there's an elephant on the show. And he's standing there with a couple kids, you know, close enough, you know, they're a little back, and the, and the audience of children, and he's talking to the trainer about elephants. And he's patting the elephant on the rear end. And, <laughs> And we have a wide shot, and all of a sudden, I saw the elephant's tail go up. <laughs> now, in life, in life, whether it's animal life or any kind of life, when something goes up, something's going to come out. So I said, "Tell him he looks great," and they gave him this, and he just kept patting, and that elephant exploded. And he cut to a commercial for chocolate candy. <laughs> oh, I am. You know, you talk about Wonderama. We should recall, just mention the name of Bob McAllister. Yeah, Bob. Bob yeah. McAllister took over after after Sonny Fox, I think. Yeah. I got one more question. Okay. Written down, just one word: Obamacare. Obamacare, you want me to make uh, jokes about o Obamacare? Well, maybe they just want I, your opinion. You know. your opinion? My, my, my opinion is that every American should have insurance and we have to figure out a way to do it. That's simple. And, and, and alternative medicine, which I'm into. I don't get pharmaceuticals. I, hey, if you're into pharmaceutical, I'm sorry. But I, I don't take anything, you know? And, you know, like I, I know that things like, uh, th 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 you read the side effects, sorry. I'm alternative. I live through alternative uh, uh, choices. And they're not covered by insurance. And so it is extremely expensive. And some of the answers to health problems are from China 4,000 years no ago. No question about it. So rather than synthesize the ingredients in a natural thing, let's get the natural thing accepted and let people pay. I went in for a drug. They were saying they wanted me to take this drug. $1,750 for the, for, the, for, for the drug, and you, get, you go every three months to get it. I said, what, what is this drug? 
what platinum is it what, made of? Why could it possibly cost? Yeah, what, what is inside of it? You know? And I think that a lot of, in my opinion, in my opinion, all right, this is a little radical, chemotherapy and, and radiation will be thought upon someday the same as bloodletting is today. Really? I think it kills more than it cures. Mm. That's my opinion. You know, and then that's, you see, and it doesn't get a laugh, and I'm not going to do it again. <laughs> On that note, no. Uh, let's see if we have one or two questions from the audience. You can just shout out. Go ahead, good and loud. Just repeat it. Uh, is there ever, ever going to be another cat's go? I didn't play it very much, but there's still a lot of Jews and trees there. You can go. <laughs> In the back, just stand up and give it to us good and loud. When did you play Element in Pocono? Oh, is that the place that has the uh, honeymoon suite sh with the bed shaped like a heart and the bathtub shaped like a heart? No? I don't remember that play. I don't, if something didn't happen really that I would never forget, I hardly remember any place I played, hmm. so I really, I really don't have an answer for that. But I, I was hysterically funny that night. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, in the, once again, just stand up and give it to us good and loud, Lee. How did you come up with the wonderful new thing about the gay burning subway? Oh, geez. All right, well, that's, I'll, I'll, that, I'm going to tell you the story of that, see? I only do the joke. This is, I think, everyone's favorite joke of mine. And I didn't think it was even a joke. I didn't think it was funny. I was coming back. Uh, it was right after my first appearance on The Tonight Show. I was coming back from Sheepshead Bay. I was on a subway. And I was sitting on a subway, and I was sitting on a, a newspaper, you know. And a man said to me, excuse me, are you reading that paper? <laughs> Now, what I did is I, I told this when I, I got to the improv and I was fixing, or Catch Rise Star, whatever, I, uh, improv, I was fixing the microphone and I said, boy, the weirdest thing happened to me, second time, see? So the first time it happened, I didn't know what to say. What are you going to say? You're nearsighted? I don't know what you're supposed to say. <laughs> so I didn't say anything. The next time it happened, I was ready. I, I said yes, I stood up and I turned the page and sat down. <laughs> Oh, wow. You know, is there another question? All right, I think. Here, here. You have a question? Oh, yes, go ahead. I just want to tell you I love you. I love you. There were you, there was Rodney, and I love Mel Brooks. He's up there. Oh, yeah. And I love you, and I love you. Oh, thank you very much. Well, you know, ladies and gentlemen, my cousin Ethel. <laughs> I want to. I, I want to close on. I want to ask you kind of. Oh, wait, well, oh, that no, was the ahead. second yes, question. Sir. Yeah. What was Carson like? What was he like? What was Carson like? Yeah, you know, I, I, I get. I got. I've gotten that question. I spent so much time with him. And all. He was. He was a, a very intelligent, very intelligent, and of course very funny, very very generous, and low key and shy, and he had his little clique of friends. You know, uh, Stephen Eady, and you know, other people, just a little clique, and they played cards with them, played tennis, they went on a sailboat. I wasn't in that crowd. I had dinner with them. I, you know, I, I bumped into them once on the street, and we walked and we were talking or something like that. But the best I could description of the, describe the metal of the man is um, I came into, uh, I was hosting the Tonight Show for a week, and I came in and on a Tuesday, and some of the uh, band guys were out, outside, and they said, yo, David, hey, you had the highest ratings last night in the history of the television, sh you know, history of the show. I said, oh, thanks, and you know, another musician with stupid humor. And I walked in, and some stagehands were there. David, congratulations, the highest rating in the history of the show, single night rating. I said, oh, thanks a lot. What are they talking about? So I went into my dressing room, and then came Fred D. Cordova. He's a producer. And he said, uh, you know, last night, your ratings were the highest in the history of the show. I said, well, I thought I was being kidded. I said, really? He said, absolutely. He said, and uh, that's the one thing I want to tell you. The other thing I want to tell you is when Johnny Carson goes away, all these years, he never calls into the show. But he's on the phone in my wow. 
in my office and wants to talk to you. So I thought right away, you can be too good for your job. You know, this is like the pink slip time. <laughs> and, but hey, I, I'm not gonna sell out, you know? We, we weren't raised in Philly to sell out. So I, I went in and I thought, oh, with trepidation, and, and I got on the phone, and, and hi, Johnny. Hey, David, how you doing? Good, good. He, and then he would always comment on jokes that he liked. You know that joke you told last night, boom, boom? I like the way you did that. I, you know, the way you thought of that for the ending, and then you topped it. That was great how you topped it. Oh, thanks, Johnny. And that, that interview with that starlet, she, he, she must have left the brain in the shower at home. He said, you know, but you got through it. You, you, you tore, took it a whole different way, and, and you got through that interview. It was really terrific. He said, and I understand that you had the highest ratings. Now, I had had the highest ratings for more than one night. You know, multi, we called it multi. Like, for the week, I would have the highest ratings, not of Johnny, but of anyone else who sat in the seat. The seat. So I had that going for me. And, but never, you know, better than Johnny. So he said, uh, I said, yeah, I, I, that's what I'm hearing. He said, well, that's why I called you. And I remember feeling that cold feeling when you know you're going to get the bad news. He said, uh, I said, yeah, Johnny. And he said, uh, because I, I want to thank you for bringing all those new fans to my show. Oh. Now that's the medal of the man. And that's where we're going to end right now. As one of my favorite college professors would say, let's just pause there. Okay. Thank oh, you wait, very much. one oh, wait. thing. David, do you yeah. have any dates coming up in New York or the tri state area you want to mention? When they heard about you interviewing me, they that all canceled. They all, they just said. <laughs> David Brenner. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.